I really believe that the exploitation of the wind resources on oceans uh, will contribute towards the next goals that we will have. Because let's not forget, net zero is not a final point of arrival, it's only one stage. The reality is that if you want to maintain temperature uh, to a certain uh, level, you need to then become carbon neutral. So in other words, you need to pull it out from the atmosphere. We're going to have to continue to work even between 2050 and 2100 to achieve that feature. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I am Matteo Coriglioni, market lead for Italy at Aurora. The focus of today's show is the current status and upcoming challenges for renewable energy development, and I have the perfect guest to discuss this with. He has been since 2016 the CEO of Falk Renewables, one of the biggest pool players in the European renewable energy sector, a group that has installed capacity of 1.3 gigawatts in countries such as Italy, UK, Spain, France, the Nordics, but also outside of Europe in the United States a project pipeline of around 4.5 gigawatts, and it also manages over 4 gigawatts of mostly onshore wind and PV plants in over 40 countries around the world. Our guest started working in the energy industry back in 2004 at the Enel Group, where he eventually covered roles such as CEO of Enel Green Power North America and country manager and CEO of Enel Romania. Finally, since 2020, our guest is also a member of the board of Wind Europe, the European association representing the wind industry. My guest on the show today is Tony Volpe. So welcome, Tony. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I'd like to start with your journey in the energy industry. As mentioned, you are a veteran of the industry. And over the last two decades, the energy world has changed significantly in many ways, from both an economics and a policy perspective. What would you say has been the largest change in the European power sector over the last 15 years? Well, you know, it's... uh... It's a change which has not affected only the European power sector, I would say, but uh, globally, um, the energy industry, particularly uh, the electricity generation sector. And the change is really um, relative to how economic and competitive um, renewable energy has become uh, pretty much you know, in the past 10 to 15 years, starting first with wind onshore, uh, becoming particularly competitive with uh, other generation sources, and then um, now solar PV, and I would say also offshore, at least fixed bottom today, is per- particularly competitive. This event has essentially revolutionized the entire industry because um, has made sure that most of the capacity additions in terms of new uh, generation capacity would be renewable and not other sources. And that um, now can be done without asking for incentives or for help. Um, So from many standpoints, the default, the standard uh, energy uh, solution today is a renewable solution, which is great news. I would say there are other events which um, have for sure um, uh, accelerated our industry, but one stands out and is for sure the commitment taken at the COP um, uh, five years ago to uh, commit uh, to a a world where uh, essentially we would try to control and mitigate the growth uh, of global warming. And, um, you know, while Uh, you know, we've done a lot of things and for sure, you know, we might have done more from that standpoint in the past five years, but that commitment has been taken and um, we don't see a scenario where countries globally are going to decrease the commitment towards that goal, but they're actually going to increase it over time. And this is going to, again, create concrete chances that uh, we will mitigate uh, the increase of uh, global warming caused by the emissions generated by humans. 
of course, what you describe is a is more of a global phenomenon. And so I'd like to ask one of the interesting aspects of your career is the very different countries you worked in from the United States to Romania, now leading a global group based in Italy. Now, we all know that the physics of the power sector are the same everywhere, but the politics, the rules governing markets can vary massively. So can you tell us a bit more about the specific challenges you faced in these different countries in terms of business and energy industry environments? You know, for sure what, you know, Romania and the US have surprisingly more in common uh, than, okay. than what you would think. Uh, for example, what they both have in common is the link between energy and country security that they see. You know, uh, it's, it's very strong in Romania, uh, the feeling that, um, you know, how can you be independent from an energy standpoint, from other sources, uh, as it is in the US. So the renewable, if you want, component of energy makes no difference from that standpoint. Uh, sometimes in other countries, more generally in Western Europe, we tend to forget a little bit the importance also of renewable energy from an energy, energy security and independency standpoint, which I do think is, is a great value, which adds on top of the environmental benefits and the cost competitiveness, competitiveness benefits um, uh, that we have. Of course, these countries, while the supply chains and the approach to the renewable industry are the same, because we're talking about a global industry, uh, you know, they different in, in terms of uh, local rules and regulations. They different when it comes to development business, which of course is much more local. And um, they differ also in terms of sometimes uh, attitude and perceptions toward renewable energy, which is again more a consequence of what you know, each individual local community feel uh, about new plants installed in their uh, vicinity rather than generally a country approach. So you could find the same challenges in one area of Romania or Italy or, or Norway versus what you find in uh, uh, the same area in the US. I'd like to shift focus a bit now and, and talk a bit about the future of the energy transition and how far renewable strategy fits into that. Uh, so let's maybe start from a wider perspective. The, the discussion on energy transition is currently framed around the idea of achieving the net zero targets by 2050. Now, even though some say this timeline is still not ambitious enough, there are some factors on the policy side in particular that can cast doubts over the actual achievement of the net zero target in 2050. So in your view, when do you think uh, is it reasonable to expect that Europe will reach a mostly decarbonized energy system? And how, how will it look like? What will be in your mind the features, so to speak, that will be the, the most different from today's world? I think we need to reflect upon, first off, you know, what is necessary to get to that goal. You know, I am confident that it can be achieved. And I think most of the European um, politicians and regulators and people of the commission believe it can be done. I think also uh, re recently, you know, there has been a, an opinion expressed also by the International Ag Energy Agency that says, well, there is a narrow path, but it can be done, right? So. But we need two things you know, to get there. First off, the investment on the technology um, is still necessary, right? So while some technologies might be um, standardized in a way, uh, like you know, solar for, you know, and, and onshore wind, it, you know, of course, they're still continuing to evolve uh, in the sense of more, greater efficiency and lower cost, um, but other, other technologies still need to go through, um, if you want, the, the, uh, the efficiency curve quite a bit to become competitive. One example is, for, is offshore floating wind, right? We, uh, we are a strong believer that um, there are going to be significant volumes of floating offshore in Europe and that we can see how you can reach a target of, I don't know, 50 euros per megawatt hour, for example, uh, you know, in the next 10 years to make it completely competitive. But we need a program, if you want, where governments are going to support such a technology. And we are also going to dedicate capital to understanding how to make it more effective. 
not necessarily for on the wind turbine technology, but on all of the, the other uh, elements, if you want, of the value chain, um, which have to do with um, floating, you know, foundations of uh, ships to, for maintenance and construction uh, and so on. Another example of where technology is going to have to make other significant steps is the integration of renewables within the grids through uh, on one end storage, which is a technology which is fairly mature for mobility, at least in light vehicles, but is not necessarily completely mature for very large scale um, uh, storage projects and needs to continue to evolve, but also the integration of the hardware, so the flexibility of, store, of batteries with the uh, uh, software uh, that goes with the management of such batteries and the uh, sort of real-time management and integration of all the components of the energy grid in, uh, in, a, in a more of a sort of uh, holistic uh, system. So, um, so technology continues to play a big component. So one big change I expect is that the technology that we will have available uh, you know, in 2050 will be radically different uh, from what we have today. You know, uh, 30 years, uh, this speed of uh, innovation and change um, are a long time and, um, and, and you can probably barely picture what's gonna, well, you know, the kind of technology we're gonna have. It's like saying, look, you know, did we picture in 1990, the kind of technology we, that we would have available today? You know, right. I don't think anybody would really be able to do that. The second aspect, which is essential, and where I also think they're going to be, there's going to be surprisingly uh, innovation uh, and uh, quite you know, creative and interesting innovation, is the concept of how are we going to share the benefits of the uh, energy transition and the investments that go into the energy transition with a broader set of stakeholders. Um, including in that group, the communities, of course, and the people that are going to host the projects, because essentially that's what we do, but also uh, the impacts on communities of the investments necessary to, uh, to create the infrastructure. So I think that companies um, need to expand the way they think about their role and their uh, purpose, if you want, uh, in, in society. Uh, of course, you know, companies continue to be, for the most part, for-profit companies. So profits are essentially uh, still a driver, but you need to look about, uh, at the creation of value from a human capital standpoint, the creation of capital from an environmental standpoint, creation of uh, a new value uh, and, and capital, uh, um, you know, from a local relationship standpoint. So all the areas of sustainability that we are, uh, keen on investing and developing. Um, so new models of participations are certainly required to, uh, to achieve that goal. So in a way, what I'm trying to say is that the technology transformation of our industry is going to have to bring also some kind of transformation also of the concept itself that we have of company and enterprise today. Really interesting analysis. And I think that, yeah, the social aspect in a way of this energy transition is something that is not discussed enough. And, I, and I'm glad you, that, that, that you mentioned that. And you, you also mentioned uh, specifically offshore. So I shall follow, follow up on that. So offshore is getting a lot of attention uh, at the moment. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, it plays a big part uh, of, uh, of your strategy uh, at Falk. As mentioned before, you're also a, a board member of Within Europe. So you're the perfect guest to ask this question to uh, how much do you think it can realistically be, be built? And also, do, do you think it can take off also in a country such as Italy that maybe has different geographic, let's say, constraints compared to France, UK, or even the Nordics? Yeah, uh, look, um, onshore is gonna is big and will continue to be big. You know, there is no strategy in Europe without onshore wind continuing to be extremely large. The question is in relative terms, you know, how much the onshore and offshore technology yeah. need to grow. So, so if we expect wind to double or treble, you know, um, in terms of installed capacity, then we are, when you're looking at offshore, you know, given at the same timeline, uh, of course, it needs to grow 10 times, right? So the relative speed is going to be different. However, let's not forget that, you know, onshore will probably, and in most scenarios, still be larger than 
than offshore. So, um, and if we don't believe that we can achieve that uh, growth in onshore, it's very difficult that offshore can pick up the tap. So the, what I'm trying to say is, look, we, you can't do a strategy of climate neutrality by 2050, uh, zero emissions, you know, you know, call it the way you want, but without counting on all the technologies available. So you're going to have to count on solar, you're going to have to count on onshore wind, you're going to have to count on offshore floating and non-floating wind, and, um, uh, and, 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 and probably also uh, in a lot of technologies that we don't, don't necessarily have it from a commercial standpoint, which have to do with carbon sequestration and storage, for example. So you need to do it all. When, when we look, however, at floating, I think the striking difference between onshore and offshore floating is the relative growth rate. And when it comes to floating, that growth rate becomes huge. You know, because you're going to go from, you know, essentially zero capacity or very little capacity, you know, 100 megawatts capacity installed at the moment to gigawatts, right? So, you know, so for floating, the growth rate is going to be another order of magnitude, uh, you know, bigger than compared to a regular fixed bottom uh, offshore. But it is an option for many countries because not every country has the option of fixed bottom. You know, uh, we have pretty... Uh, deep um, uh, seas, you know, uh, uh, and um, and therefore you need to consider how to tackle those depths that go from, you know, 50, 60 meters to uh, ideally even a thousand meters, but, you know, even just the, the 50 to 200 meter depth needs to be addressed, which is where a lot of wind in some cases can be found. So these are places that make a lot of sense, sense from a wind production uh, generation standpoint. Um, so crowded countries, you know, without many other options, they will look at floating offshore. Everybody's looking. I think clearly Scotland is taking the lead. Uh, as, you know, generally speaking, the UK has already taken the lead also in uh, fixed bottom. I think that is going to be important, not only for Scotland, that program, uh, but it's also going to be important for the improvement in technology, which will, you know, which also other countries would benefit from. Um, so, um, you know, we praise, if you want, in, in, from a certain standpoint, the vision of the Scottish government to uh, push forward in that direction because it's going to be a global, uh, you know, uh, driver for growth uh, in all the other uh, countries. Um, so, if you extend the time horizon, right? So, if you look at the next 50 years, uh, then probably floating offshore might take even a lead over time compared to fixed bottom, simply because there is more space and availability to, um, to build those wind farms. So I really believe that the um, exploitation of the, the wind resources on oceans uh, will you know, contribute towards the next goals that we will have. Because let's not forget, net zero is, only, is not a final point of arrival, it's only one stage. The reality is that if you want to maintain temperature, uh, to a certain uh, level, you need to then become carbon neutral. So in other words, you need to, you know, pull it out from the atmosphere. So, uh, so, so we're, we're going to have to continue to work even between 2050 and 20, 2100 to, um, uh, to achieve that feature. Yeah, we are getting so we, we are so focused right now on this intermediate stage in twenty or the, the net zero in twenty fifty that that you're right. The discussion of what what the next step is is, is rapidly being entertained. Good. Uh, after discussing these big pictures items, let's say I, I'd like to come to to facts specifically. So. Uh, the next decade, of course, will be crucial for the energy transition. And uh, how would you describe as part your main strategic priorities for, for the coming decades? Uh, I, I would imagine the one area of considerations for a group such as yours when outlining also our growth tra trajectory is striking the right balance between deepening the presence in your core markets versus maybe expanding to new markets, new technologies. Can you tell us something about how you think about this balance? Well, look, first of all, you know, let's see, you know, beside our uh, strategy, which is how we get to where we want to get, um, the question is, you know, what is our purpose as a company, given the competencies that we, we have? 
And I think our purpose is really be an enabler of the growth that is necessary uh, to reach, you know, the social goals of climate, you know, uh, transition, uh, sorry, energy transition, sorry. Um, so our job is essentially going to be how to support the acceleration that is necessary in the industry in terms of new capacity uh, installed. And therefore developing projects is what we do. And that's how we contribute towards that, that, um, that goal. Of course, we have to do it in a sustainable way. So we have to do it trying to figure out also a way to generate value, as we said before, not only for ourselves, but also for the other stakeholders that are involved in our, in our business. Um, and because not everything can be done alone, but more and more, especially if you have in mind this over, overarching goal of the energy transition, um, things have to be done with partners. So we are, uh, if you want, an element of a broader network of uh, relationships where we're going to have to play our role, again, to develop projects in a sustainable way, but we're also going to have to be open uh, to uh, partnerships uh, from several standpoints. Um, that's why, for example, on the floating offshore part, uh, we have partnered with um, Blue Float, with Orsted. You know, everybody's bringing their best competencies and, and know-how and sharing essentially those competencies to uh, be more competitive on those projects. And same thing, uh, you know, on the hydrogen front, for example, we are partnering with other companies because, you know, green hydrogen projects are the, uh, if you want, quintessential projects that need to be developed, you know, with many partners, right? Because you need to look at the overall value chain, not only of production of energy, energy, but how you distribute it, transport it, who's gonna use it and so on. So these are unthinkable features to be pulled, uh, you know, if you isolate yourself, you can only achieve good results if you work with others. That's why we've been working with the idea of consortium, for example, on the front of, uh, of, of, of green hydrogen. Um, so, we know what our job is, and that's where you know, we want to get better at it. We clearly have a starting uh, geographical attention, which is extremely strong in Europe. That's where most of our pipeline is. is in particular, I would say, uh, you know, the Italian, Spain, but also the UK, Netherlands, Scandinavia, and so on. Significant effort ongoing also in the US. But also in the US, for example, we par we're partnering with DNI because we realize that in order to be a relevant player in a very large market joining forces with another uh, company that desired to have a significant role in that market is probably one of the best way to achieve it, right? So, um, and then, you know, we think we have also a vision of um, sort of integrating uh, digital technologies, hardware, meaning the PV plants and wind farms and and batteries into something that is working seamlessly, seamlessly uh, to provide um, solutions for customers. In other words, uh, not only we, we want to generate new kilowatt hours, but we also want to generate the kilowatt hours in the way that they are desired by our customers. So we want to make sure that we understand what the customer needs are, and we are able, which by the way, are not only, you know, we want green electrons, they also want to save uh, you know, energy. They also want to be more flexible. They also want to decarbonize their businesses and try to provide solutions for our customers, which are broader than just delivering new green electrons. You mentioned uh, explicitly your, your expansion in the, in the United States. So I wanted to ask, in, in 2019, you expanded also your, your portfolio to energy storage with a facility in North America. So, so first of all, I, what led you to start your batteries development in the US rather than Europe? Was something related to that specific opportunity or was there a broader uh, strategic decision being made to start your battery storage business in the US rather than Europe? But look, uh, you know, sometimes you're driven by opportunities and good intuition, of, you know, from people, right? So in that case, we had, uh, you know, our colleague, which was the original developer of the project that, you know, threw in, you know, uh, 
uh, an option, you know, in, in the initial discussion with the UDDD, and then that, you know, it was, and the team was great at developing that notion, that idea into uh, convincing the counterpart thing to want to, which is the off taker, you know, want to also uh, consider having, uh, having a battery. So for no special reason, other than, you know, if you want uh, human ingenuity, that's, you know, that's why we started from the US. But for us, you know, that's the tip of the iceberg in a way, in the sense, you know, you see that battery that's operational, but the notion is that all of our pipeline, or you know, all of the projects that we have in pipeline are developed, are developed with the concept that they will host storage capacity. How much, you know, for how many hours, you know, many megawatts, how many megawatt towers exactly when, these are all things that we figure out depending also on the rules, which are defined by, you know, by the, you know, the regulatory bodies in each given country. But, you know, our concept is that solar onshore in particular, but also wind onshore will have some kind of hybridization with batteries. Um, so I always draw this uh, parallel with the automotive industry. It's like thinking that you're not going to have some kind at least of hybrid engine today. You know, and it's like if we were only developing internal combustion engines uh, and, and forgetting about what's happening right on the uh, on the rest of the um, of the technology evolution. So more renewables means um, you know higher challenge. An higher challenging environment for integration of renewables. There's no question about it. You need the flexibility. Today, the technology that can provide this flexibility is storage, it's chemical storage. Of course, hydroelectric as well, but it's very difficult to realize uh, and build new, new, you know, hydro storage facilities. And, um, you know, we're going to have to push in that direction. Then, if 30 years from now, we will have more other technologies for flexibility management, you know, compressed air or, you know, you name it. Of course, we will look into those. But at the moment, you know, what works is um, chemical storage through essentially lithium batteries. Speaking of, yeah, getting new, more renewables into the system, we are entering a phase where renewables development is more and more based on merchant investments and PPAs rather than subsidies. And in that context, there is a lot of attention to the growth of the corporate PPA market. So I'd like to ask, how big do you see the role of corporates being in the development of renewables? And in particular, what can renewables developers generator offer to large corporations? Uh, first off, what we offer is what they want right now, right? Which is clean energy. No, but most of the corporates want to make sure that they're, uh, because of the, uh, you know, important the ESG, ESG is for them and for their customers that, um, you know, their carbon footprint is uh, reduced. So we have exactly what they want and they desire. Uh, then the PPA is sort of the commercial agreement by which you decide to exchange, you know, the product, which is, you know, the decarbonized energy. Uh, but uh, when we sort of paint uh, a picture of what the future will look like, we definitely think that everybody's going to want green energy, you know, and green energy is going to be, you know, hundred uh, percent of the electricity. And actually there's going to be more uh, industrial and, and, com and, and consumer uh, uses of uh, non-electric uh, fuels that will convert to electricity. Um, so, so in a way, uh, you know, direct agreements like the one with industrial called PPA will be the way uh, you know the industry will continue to grow in the future but it will not only apply to large industrials you know large industrials are the one that you know first are coming to the table they have significant significant volumes they have structures and the ability to understand how to negotiate a ppa but over time i think this will move also to the smaller industrial, you know, the, you know, small companies, PMIs, um, and also to uh, consumers. There is no reason why consumers wouldn't want to also buy 100% energy. Of course, they will buy in a different way. You know, they will buy through aggregation of demand, um, uh, but because you know, you, they can't sign each one of them on PVA, but this is going to happen. 
in a way, consumers are probably even more ideal than corporates to be the natural buyers of clean electricity um, because of uh, you know, their higher, if you want, uh, uh, sensitivity towards choosing you know, decarbonized energy. In the past, this usually meant you know, paying more. To right now, it actually means saving money. Right? So, so I, could, I think they're going to push their suppliers to make sure that they do that. Now, there is a little bit of a conflict of interest there, right? Because the suppliers also are for for-profit business. Um, but, you know, this is why, for example, we advocate standards of renewable energy procurement sourcing being, being imposed on suppliers and government entities. Um, you know, because again, it makes no economic sense not to do it. And on top, if it makes no environmental sense, but you need to force people to accelerate that. That brings me right in, into my next topic. So the, the, the role of policy, even though markets are more and more, say, protagonists of the energy transition, the role of policy still cannot be, uh, let's say, all, uh, overlooked. And we have seen and we've discussed it already, how political support for decarbonization and renewables development has picked up substantially over the last few years. I would say both at the European and, and, and national levels, pretty much in all the main countries you operate in. But uh, do you think that the measures and the discussion right now is, is adequate? In other words, is it too little too late? Or, or do you see things going in the right direction from a policy perspective? So are the actual policies, decisions that have been taken the, the effective ones in a way? Or are, just, uh, or are we just leaving too much on the, let's say, empty targets that, that don't translate right into actual, actual decisions from all the stakeholders involved? Look, um, I think that the commitment towards reaching the goals of the energy transition are fantastic. You know, we have never seen a better alignment at political, political level where um, parties also coming from very different point of views agree on what needs to be done. Yeah. And uh, that translates into uh, new policies, right? Which are, are being implemented. And I think um, most of the governments are trying to uh, make a, a sincere effort to come up with new policies that will help the transition. Some governments are also concerned about the sustainability and the impact on uh, those people that are more disadvantaged or those people that are, you know, are lower income, which is, for example, one of the concerns that now uh, people have in Spain, correctly so, in my view, and also other countries. Uh, what, what I think, where we, I think in most governments are probably missing the mark is, in, is it by thinking that what they need to do is sometimes particularly complex. Okay. While there, were me, there, there would be some low hanging fruits, so some things which would be extremely simple that wouldn't require uh, you know, huge decision making or, or very different rules to accelerate the transition because their job is really accelerate the transition, uh, enable the possibility to accelerate. It. And again, I go back to my example before, you know, you have huge volumes of energy purchased by government entities in each country. They still do not have a mandate to buy 100% renewable energy in terms of electricity or, or even decarbonized energy in terms of fuel. If they did that, which is a decision that can be taken without particular effort, you know, they would become a large buyer in the market and they would accelerate the transition towards the right direction. We are pushing electric mobility. There is not a link or a, um, 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 a mandate to make sure that each and every kilowatt hour that gets, you know, is put into an electric vehicle is green. And, you know, electric vehicles are good if the electricity is green. Sure. Otherwise, yes, they're still better than a, an internal combustion engine for other pollution reasons, but from a karma standpoint, you know, it's not, um, it's not much better. So these are the, the real simple thing to do, uh, which you are not 
yet doing. Then, of course, there are even you know a lot more other complicated things, and but that we understand you know will take more time. For example, all the permits. So, our in the industry, the energy industry, and again, the lesson that Romania and the United States teach us uh, is very clear: energy is national security, is independence, is interdependence from a macroeconomic, macro geopolitical standpoint. So it's never easy and it's always regulated. In other words, there are lots of rules everywhere in the energy sector, rules for development, rules on how the electricity market works. So to believe that this is an industry which is a free market, you know, uh, you know like producing and selling a good, uh, you know, it's wrong, you know, and, and it's correct because, you know, that's how, you know, it should be for energy. Um, so it's always usually regulated. Governments have a huge impact. Um, but again, they need to be also, um, you know, they need to apply, you know, the logic whereby the first do what's easier. And sometimes that gets lost because of political discussions and, uh, or simply because you know there is a you know they might not necessarily have uh, all of the competencies. So right. going forward, what, what we see is governments which are going to be effective also in the dialogue with industry at all levels, governments which are going to listen to the stakeholders uh, and are going to be able to prioritize uh, and um, uh, are also going to be the the ones which will achieve their targets better. Right. A lot of cooperation and dialogue is necessary at this point. As I said before, everybody should understand they're part of a broader network of interdependent actors. And we are only going to find a solution to what is a common good problem, which is you know, uh, climate change, if we cooperate. Very interesting stuff. And I, and I guess that these same considerations also apply to, to Italy specifically, where no, Absolutely. The, the, the you see me making not a lot of, you know, I don't try to comment too much on Italy versus the rest because Italy is part of a group of pictures. Yeah. So whatever needs to happen everywhere else needs to happen in Italy. The Ital Italian government, I think, is no less uh, driven by the willingness to support, uh, you know, the energy transition than others. And I think they're like others, they are moving some reasonable steps at this stage. Good. Uh, so, as we usually do, I I'd like to conclude our show by asking you about some concepts in the energy transition, whether you think they are overrated or, or underrated. Of course, short answer, totally fine. The idea here is just that it's very easy to say in abstract whether something is good or bad, but, but in practice, for example, when making investment decisions today, some of the things we are carried away with are actually overrated in the relevant. So, there are factors currently underrated in the general public discussion that are in fact quite impactful. So I provide a, a couple of those uh, overrated and underrated question. And the first one is very interesting in my mind. So the impact of next generation EU fund in accelerating the energy transition in Europe, is it underrated, overrated, uh, properly rated in the general public discussion? I think it's properly rated. I think it's uh, one of those catalysts that will start the acceleration project process. What is overrated is just believing that it's going to be enough. It won't be enough, it's, you know. It's um, but it's good. It's a good starting point. Yeah, and this this last points I, I very much agree with. In particular, in uh, in Italy over the last uh, twelve months, the recovery plan has been the object I would say of, of too much of a lot of hype. Like it is kind of the fix for all the long-standing issues. It is a useful tool, but it will not be enough alone, for sure. The second one is the the role of hydrogen in in the energy transition. Underrated, overrated? I think it's a bit overrated. Um, meaning hydrogen will be important. We need a, a clean fuel, you know, a zero carbon fuel of some sort. Um, but in the time scale of events, I think it will probably be material a little bit less versus what people expect today. And finally, I think we, we, we touched upon this a couple of times throughout uh, the discussion, disruptive technologies as opposed to gradual improvements on existing ones. Do you think their roles in the energy transition is, uh, is probably accounted for? And this became a bit of, of a discussion topic also in Italy last week after the Minister for the Green Transition publicly mentioned fourth generation nuclear as an option worth 
investigating more and generating a lot of pushback on that. What, what, what's your take on the role of destructive technologies? Are we thinking about well, that too little? What I think that is completely underrated and you know, we should pay a lot more attention is um, addressing carbon directly. So all the technologies which have to do with um, uh, sequestration of carbon, storage of carbon, and also use of carbon for products, being carbon capture and use, should um, be pushed more, investigated more, and receive a lot more funding you know, from a research uh, standpoint. Because as we said, ultimately, our mission is to stop adding too much carbon to the atmosphere and pull it out. So we're going to have to address the carbon which is already in the atmosphere somehow directly. You know, um, generating energy from renewable sources avoids additional carbon, right? Uh, but doesn't do anything with the carbon that is already there. Um, so if we wait for nature to address it, it will take, you know, it will take too long and it will take us to uh, climate pattern changes, which are, uh, you know, extremely impactful for our current civilization. So there are, you know, interesting technologies from that standpoint, but, um, but I don't see, you know, how, you know, the current policies really accelerate on, on those fronts. From that standpoint, I think the US is probably will end up doing something, something sooner than us. Mm -hmm. uh, there are interesting legislation in California. There is federal legislation in the US to provide incentives for um, carbon capture and storage, for example. We don't have anything in Europe. So for me, that is the biggest missing and underrated component of our current uh, current strategy. I would say this is a natural note to, to, to finish on. Uh, it was a pleasure talking with you, discussing your take on the status and challenges of the energy transition. Really interesting stuff. So, Tony Volpe, th thank you so much for taking the time to, to join our show. Thank you for having me. That was Matteo Corrilioni, market lead for Italy at Aurora, talking to Tony Volpe, CEO of Falk Renewables. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye. <laughs>